I'd now like to introduce our first speaker for the evening. Scott McConnell co-founded the American Conservative with Pat Buchanan and Taki in 2002 and served as editor for six years. Scott received his PhD from Columbia and was formerly a frequent contributor to Commentary and National Review and also served as an editor of the New York Post. He is the author of several books, including his most recent, Ex Neocon, <laughs> Dispatches from the Post-9-11 Ideological Wars. And perhaps one of the smartest and most provocative writers at TAC, as he continues to be an ardent voice for our ideas in the public square. It is a fact that the American, could, that the American conservative would not exist today if it wasn't for Scott McConnell. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you, and boy, I have never thought I'd get an introduction like that. Thank you. Um, today, uh, tonight, um, I'm not going to recapitulate the things that are in the article in the magazine that you have, which talks about some of the ideological reasons for which Pat Taki and I started the magazine. Uh, but instead, I'm going to talk about some of the initial press and journal reception we got, which I have to say, some of which is, is less uplifting than what we've heard before from Bill Kaufman and, and Johnny but it, it important, interesting, uh, nonetheless. Um, the to New York Times played our emergence pretty much down the middle. Uh, the late David Carr visited our offices a few weeks before our first issue. Uh, he stressed Pat Buchanan's anti-Iraq war views. Uh, this was September 2002, so you can see we're closer to our sweet 16th and 15th anniversary. Um, he nicely quoted me about the decline in economic security and life chances of the American working class. He wrote uh, kind of wryly about uh, our questioning United States support for Israel, saying in a statement which made me chuckle that uh, Mr. Theodorakopoulos defines the outer limits of that debate. Um, about Buchanan, Carr wrote perceptively, with his current Jeremiads against adventurism in Iraq and his protectionist bent toward the American worker, he has more in common with the left in the current debate about where the country is going. Uh, there was certainly something to this in 2002, uh, well before the sharp turn of the left towards intersectional identity politics. Um, Many papers and blogs uh, greeted us by stressing the, uh, the odd couple theme, talking about the personality differences between Pat and Taki. Uh, exemplary was Peter Carlson of the Washington Post style section. Uh, that's where the photo of the three of us you can see in the magazine was taken. Uh, on a right wing and a player, Buchanan teams up with Rich Playboy to launch magazine, was the headline. Uh, Carlson quoted one of his fellow journalists asking, Pat, you're famous for your family values espousal and opposition to unfettered immigration. Taki is a famous philanderer who has been busted for cocaine. Uh, isn't he the kind of immigrant you'd like to keep out? Um, um, Carlson wrote that Buchanan looked startled for a moment and then he said, I don't think he came over the Rio Grande. And, Ta <laughs> and Taki quickly interjected that he came over on his yacht. Um, Carlson spent a lot of ink on Taki's romantic life, which was a source of fascination for many, uh, quoting him chiding American men for divorcing their wives to marry younger women instead of taking mistresses the way Europeans do. Uh, how does that square with Buchanan's trumpeting of family values? Uh, Taki said, well, I agree with Pat, but I'm no angel. <laughs> uh, the piece 
barely mentioned our anti-war and glo anti-globalization themes, but it, this was, it was all good, a photo illustrated piece on the front page of the Washington Post style section. Um, response to attack is more serious and rancorous in the ideological press. In the New Republic, Franklin Four, who would soon become the editor, wrote about Buchanan's surefire flop. Surefire flop. Uh, he stressed our absurdly poor timing. Um, a year ago, he wrote, a, a non-interventionist conservative conservatism might have been plausible, but not in the summer of 2002. On this side of the Atlantic, it has become clear that 9-11 hasn't boosted the non-interventionist right. It has extinguished it. Instead of America firstism, 9-11 has produced a war on terrorism that has virtually ended American qualms about expending blood and treasure abroad. Buchanan and his friends couldn't have chosen a worse time to start a journal of the isolationist right. Um, I I'd laugh at this now, but it's, it's worth preserving as a perfect expression of the conventional beltway wisdom of the time, uh, completely ignorant of Middle Eastern history or colonial history or, or any history. Um, for its part, National Review contented itself with impugning the patriotism of our writers and editors for opposing the war. Um, a different and also revealing response came from magazines smaller than the New Republic. Notable was Partisan Review, which decided for its very last issue after nearly 70 years of publication to print a 5,000 word attack on the American conservative, <laughs> uh, which at that point had been in print for a little over a month. Uh, Partisan Review it was an important journal to many, uh, including to me, and the attack was penned by the late Irving Lewis Horowitz, uh, whom I kind of knew because his publishing house, Transaction, had uh, published my dissertation in the 80s, for which I'm, I'm naturally grateful, um, a book based on my dissertation. Uh, as you know, Partisan Review had moved from being pro-communist in the 30s to anti-Stalinist but still socialist for a long time uh, to neoconservative, if never quite explicitly so. Um, and all these factional categories are were important back in the day and in a way still are. Horowitz used his review to slam Buchanan, an intellectual figure to be reckoned with and a dangerous one. Tack editors, he wrote, tap into long-standing sources of discontent. Their sentiments are better described as an extension of the left fascism, which is nibbled at the edges of American politics since World War II. Uh, what a, what a nice thing to say, right? Um, he compares us to Lyndon LaRouche and, and Charles Coughlin. Uh, Mines Buchanan's early columns in the uh, magazine for allegedly scary things. He puts Pat's phrase, the occupation of the West Bank, into scare quotes. Uh, he complains that Pat thought that the United States, through its voracious appetite to rule the world, helps to bring about terrorism. Uh, I'd acknowledge that there's some truth to that, uh, that description of Pat's belief and to the belief itself. But the central villain, according to Horowitz for TAC, is an economy that in its nature is global in structure and as with the fascist vision, the promise of social justice depends on the commitment of all to a state system. Um, so what Horowitz is labeling fascist here is the belief, which is one shared by most Americans and increasingly by most Europeans, that a democratic nation state is a better guarantor of self-determination and liberty than rule by EU bureaucrats or whatever alternative Horowitz might have had in mind. Um, he closes with some warnings. It's dangerous to scoff at the ravings of political extremes 
and if the consensus which has been tenuously stitched together after the 9-11 bombing fails to hold, then look for Buchanan or a more credible look-alike to emerge as a potent force in the years to come. Uh, this kind of thing was not unique to partisan review. Ron Radosh did it in a piece uh, in the Boston Globe. Um, and of course, it's now done regularly to President Trump. Uh, what they are really saying is that virtually any kind of national sentiment or policy where nations favor their own citizenry is illegitimate and dangerous and essentially fascist. But this standard is only applied to Western countries, never to China or India or, of course, Israel. Um, so to sum up, more or less in the same month we were called unpatriotic by national review and fascist by partisan review for advocating policies that would easily have been supported and in some cases were supported by President Eisenhower. Um, this is not a terrible thing. I think the, the intensity of the invective leveled at us confirmed that we were saying some important and necessary things, and if you're not ready to be attacked by this, there are more lucrative fields than opinion journalism. Uh, but it's not a good thing either, and it's a sign of a genuinely positive evolution, uh, reflecting most of all that TAC has been proven correct in most of its stands, that the name-calling of this nature has largely ceased. <laughs>